Welcome. This week we are discussing Parsha Bechukaisai, which is the last portion in the book of Ayikra. The book of Ayikra that we just been, we are reading it for a number of months is also known as the book of Korbanas, of offerings and sacrifices. And this week is going to be the last Pasha of the book of Ayikra, and the name of the Pasha is called Bechu Kaisai. The word Bechu Kaisai comes from the term called Chok, which is laws, or it's also being translated as statutes, and the Torah or decrees. And the Torah begins, first of all, by introducing the blessings for all those who follow the laws. Beautiful blessings, tremendous blessings, which is the beginning of the Pasha in chapter 26, verse three, when it says, Im telechu, if you will go in my decrees and observe my commandments, vasisemoisom, and you will perform them. So it starts with a whole beautiful, amazing list of brocha, Bracha means blessing. The first and most important blessing is rain. When there is rain, then you have what to eat, and the animals have what to eat, and you have what to drink. And as the Torah begins, I will provide you rain in their appropriate time. And then the Torah promises us security. And you will dwell securely in your land. Venatati Shalom Ba'aretz. I will provide peace in the land. Peace. In other words, you can have food, as Rashi says, and you can have drink, but if there is no peace, it's worthless. It's nothing. What are you going to do with all the food and the drink if you keep on running for your life and being in fear of somebody coming with a gun, God forbid, and taking your life away? So therefore comes the Torah and tells us that you should know Benatati Shalom Ba'aretz. There is going to be peace. And as Rashi says, Shalom Shokul Kenegad Akoil. Peace is as, is as, is as important as equally important to everything else, all combined. Shalom He makes peace and creates everything, as the verse tells us, is to compare peace to everything else that we have. Everything combined does not come to the importance of, of peace. And now, we have with us also important in this parsha that in addition to the security and the food and all the wonderful things that we are having, this is all good if we follow the mitzvot. What happens if God forbid we are not following God's commandments, we are not doing what he asks us to do, then it starts on verse 15, a long list, Im tim asu, and if you will consider my decrees revolting, tigal nafshechem, and you will reject my commandments, you will undo the covenant, you will annul the covenant that you have with me. So from verse 16, all the way till the almost the end of the chapter, not almost, till the end of the chapter, verse 45. You have almost 30 verses, more than 30 verses, which has the most harsh, difficult, most challenging admonishment, most challenging words, and difficult decrees which will befall the Jewish people 
for not following the commandments. This is known in tradition as the toichacha. Toichacha means from the word admonishment, lochiach, or rebuke. And we are reading those verses, and we read it every year, and we read it, and we actually can look back in history, and as some commentaries are doing, is they relate those verses to some past historical situations which fell upon the Jewish people, and they compare it to what the Torah is writing in this week's parsha. And I don't want, need to read it for you. You can read it for yourself. Very, very difficult words, very difficult scenarios of situations. For example, Verodaf Oisom Koil Ole Nidof. Hashem says, the sand of a broken leaf will pursue them meaning you will get afraid just by hearing the shaking of a leaf. You will think, oh, the Russians are coming. North Korea is about to launch a, a missile upon you. There was nothing, it was outside your tree. It's moving a little, but you will be penetrated with fear and you are going to, go, you are going to um, constantly be on the run the Torah says, you will be on the run and you would fall while you're running, but no one is pursuing you. Nobody is even running after you. You will stumble each man of, it, of the other. There's even nobody running after you. There's going to be so much chaos and so much uncertainty and so much trouble that this is the situation. Like I said, 30 verses are very difficult descriptions after reading a number of verses of the reward. But then comes a surprising verse. The surprising verse is on verse 42. Verse 42 reads as follows. Vezacharti et brisi Yaakov. I will remember my covenant with Jacob. Ve'af is brisi Yitzchak. And also my covenant with Isaac, Yaakov's father. Ve'af is brisi Avram, Esquire. And also my covenant with Abraham, will I remember? Ve'oretz Esquire, and I will remember the land. Interesting that in the middle of this whole situation, God mentions our parents, our patriarchs, where we come from. What is the connection and how does this relate to what we are in the middle of discussing the difficult scenario? So there's a number of insights by different commentaries. I have my favorite one. My favorite one was said by a very beautiful um, it, it was called the Magid. The olden days, they used to have traveling rabbis. There was not puppet rabbis, but there was a Magid was like someone who traveled around from small community to small community, maybe sometimes in the bigger cities. And people used to gather in the synagogue to hear a lecture of mainly words of inspiration. One of those Magidim who lived about 300 years ago was known as the Magid of Duvna. The Yaakov of Duvna. His, his uh, specialty was that everything he spoke about, it was always with a parable. Like you know, Amaisa, always some are creating a scenario, and through that scenario, allowing you to understand what the Torah wants from you. So when it comes to this verse, the Zohaiti and Brisi Yaakov. And he asked the question that everybody is asking. Why is it and how is it that in the midst of a discussion of admonishment, suddenly God mentions who we come from? So he says, Amaisa. He explains it with a story as he always does. He says there were two thieves who were caught stealing. 
and they both ended up in front of the judge. One of them, the judge finds out the father is a Ganov, the brothers are Ganovim, the Zayda was even a Ganov. This child was raised and born to a family of thieves. So the judge says, no, what can I expect? This was his education. This is what he heard growing up in the house. Who are we going tonight? How was it last night? Who are we going to break in? Is it worth it, not worth it? Is there a police car, not a police car? Are they watching us, not watching us? So never a child being brought up in such a, in such a, in such a, an environment. So he gave him a punishment. But then the second person, the second thief, who grew up in a nice family, a healthy family, a family of successful business people, they earn the living. He turns to the child, he says, you? Where does this come to? Why are you stealing? You deserve a much bigger punishment for behaving this way you behave based on who the family that you grew up with. Says the Maggid of Duvna, this is exactly what God is doing over here. He is giving us the admonishment and at the same time, he's also, he's also at the same time telling us let me remind you, I'm not just stamazing. I'm not just punishing you for no reason. The reason that you are in such trouble because I remember who you come from. I remember who the Zayda was and I remember who the father was. And based on the parents that you had, I would have expect you to look much, much nicer. And this is the way it mentions here in the passion. And the point is, that the matriarchs are mentioned, and it's not the only place they are mentioned. They are mentioned here, but also earlier by the story of the golden calf and Moshe Rabbeinu is pleading with God to forgive the Jewish people for what they did. So it also says, the Bible Shalom says, Schoer le'avram le'yitzchak, Please remember Abraham, remember Isaac, remember Israel, your servant, that you had sworn to them, but and you spoke to them and you told them, you told them that I shall increase your offsprings as like the stars of the heavens. And you, God, you spread that the land, the entire land, which I spoke to them, that I shall give it to them, I am going to give it to as an heritage to their children. So Moshe is asking Hashem, please remember. Remember. Remember where they come from. Remember who their fathers were. And based on that, what's going to happen? Hopefully, you can forgive them the golden calf. And you wonder, remembering is doing things better or worse? I thought if you're trying to plea on someone's behalf, and you're going to remind the judge what kind of wonderful father and Zayda was, the judge is going to say, exactly, that's why you deserve to patch. That's why you deserve to get punished for what you're doing knowing that where you come from, what is the education you got? So we expect much better. Why is Moshe mentioning our forefathers at the same time when he's asking to forgive us for something very bad we did like the golden calf? But very interestingly is also that when Moshe speaks to God and he says, Remember our forefathers, so he says, remember Avraham, remember Yitzchak, and remember Yaakov. He calls them Israel. In this week's parsha, the way God says, I will remember your parents, it mentions Yaakov first, and then Yitzchak, and then Avraham. So it's mentioned in the, in the opposite way than the chronological order of their birth. So this question was actually asked 
by Rashi himself. Rashi was surprised and Rashi wondered why is it that, they, that the patriarchs are listed in a reverse order, right? Yaakov, Yitzchak, and Avram. And Rashi explains the following insights. Rashi says that, God, that the verse is so-called as if to say that really Jacob, Yaakov, which is the youngest of the patriarchs, is alone sufficient for this matter, meaning it's alone enough that the Jewish people should be redeemed through his merit, to the merit of Yaakov. But if for some reason he is not sufficient, so now I'm going to add Yitzchak along with them. And still, if it's still not going to be enough, then I'm adding also Avram, which for sure Avram will bring enough of credit to allow me to remember the children and redeem them from this difficult situation. In other words, Rashi understands the way the verse is written by us is simply not like we said earlier, a, a, another, another, you know, another, um, another way of increasing the punishment by remembering who we came from. No, Rashi understands that really God wants to help us. He wants to help us. We are in a difficult situation and we need help. We really need help. We are in exile, and now we are looking to be redeemed. So one way of achieving redemption is get to work. Make yourself worthy to be redeemed. Make yourself qualified, so you're going to get the redemption. Fix your behavior, improve yourself. Here the verse tells us, that regardless of where, what you are, but after you went through so much, the old admonishment that was mentioned till this verse, and you were in exile and you suffered and there was fear and there was dread and there was so much pain, comes to a point God says, okay, must speak. Must speak means, okay, enough is enough, but what's the credit? Why, why, why is it enough? And what's the merit based on what? Am I going to help you out now? So Hashem says, listen, I cannot look away. They have tremendous credit. They had a Zayda called Rabbi Yankel, and another Zayda called Rabbi Yitzchak, and a third Zayda called Rabbi Avramo. So they have such Zaydas. Even Yaakov should be enough if we need it. For sure if we're going Yitzchak, for sure if we're getting Avram. And this is actually the key to bring an end to all this suffering. It's called in Hebrew, Zechut Avot, or in Yiddish they say, Zechus Aves. Zechut means the merit, Avot means our forefathers. It's the merit of our forefathers. The merit of our forefathers is always something that we are using while beseeching God for support or help, for delivery, deliverance, we always try to go back to our forefathers. And what is the credit about our forefathers? So if we go back to the story of the golden calf, Rashi tells us something very, very beautiful, which really relates to what's happening in this parasha. Rashi says that why is Moshe mentioning Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, each one separately? So he says as follows, master of the world, I'm going to read you in English. If they transgress the Ten Commandments, and that's why you want to punish them, so you should know and remember that their forefather Abraham was tested with ten trials and has not yet received his reward for passing those trials. And therefore, Give it to them. Let the ten cancel out this ten. Let the ten values uh, and the ten pieces of credit 
so to speak, credits that Avram has by standing by the famous 10 trials, starting with his living or Kasdim and this ultimately to the binding of Isaac, the famous 10 trials that Avram went through in his life. So, Esser Bishmel Esser, let it turn, cancel it then. This is the first thing that he mentions of Rome. And then Rashi continues that Hashem, Moshe is telling God, I'm mentioning you, Avram, and I'm going to mention Yitzchak, and I'm going to mention Yaakov. But let me tell you why. He says as follows If they are done to be burned, if, they are, if somehow they deserve the punishment of having their life be consumed in fire, we know when that happened, God forbid, during the Holocaust. If that's what they are deserving as punishment, says Moshe, in that case, remember Avraham, that he gave himself over to be burned for your sake in Ur Kasdim. Remember the story of Ur Kasdim? It was Nimrod who took Avraham and he put him in a fiery furnace. That's why it's called Ur. Ur means fire. As the Torah tells us in the end of Lech Lecha, and he was miraculously saved. But Avram, before Avram was thrown into the furnace, Avram had a choice. If he would have give up his belief in God and stop bothering everybody to stop worshiping idols, that was his chance to be, to be saved from the terrible punishment of being thrown into the fiery furnace. But Avram obviously did not give up a moment. He did not give up in any way his emuna, his faith, his belief in God. And he was thrown into the ur he was thrown into that furnace. So Moshe tells God, hello, if you feel that you want to punish them with fire, their father went in fire for your sake. And he continues, if you want to punish them by just killing them by sword? Let me remind you, their next father, his name was Yitzchak, he had stretched out his neck to be slaughtered by a sword, by a knife, the famous story of the binding of Isaac. He had a choice. He could have said, Dad, I'm not doing it. He wouldn't just tie him up and do it against his will. Yitzchak, as the Torah tells us, when Yitzchak asked his father on the way to the Akeda, he tells dad, I see the wood, I see the fire, but I don't see the sheep. Where are you going to get a sheep? And his dad responded to him, you are the sheep. You are going to be the one to be offered. And the verse says, they both walk jointly together, Yitzchak together with Avram, with the same enthusiasm, with the same simcha, now that Yitzchak already found out that he is going to be the one. <clears throat> you are going to be seen as the burned offering, and he walks together along with his father, and they lie down on the altar and he stretched out his neck and he says, go for it. Until the angel came and said, no, 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 no. It was never meant to happen. It was just a test. Are you kidding? Would God allow you to slaughter Yitzchak? But you and Yitzchak, you both passed the test. So Moshe is telling God, you want to place, allow a sword against you people? They have already went through the sword. And it was their father Yitzchak who was ready to do it without any hesitation. <coughs> and then Moshe continues, the third one, if you think that if you're not going to burn them, you're not going to kill them by sword, but let them at least be exiled. So I want to remind you, they had already a father who went to exile. Remember Yaakov, that he went to exile to Choron. He went to exile. 
he left his house, he left his parents, he went to exile, running away from Esau. So he really did it. They did it, they did it on our behalf. They don't have to go through it again. And then he said, if this is still not enough, you promised I'm going to, to Avram, I'm going to make you into a great nation. And now you have four credits. He calls it, Rashi calls it, Kise Shel Shosharegalim. You have, you have that the credit of Avram, you have the credit of Yitzchak, you have the credit of uh, Yaakov, and you obviously have also the credit of the promise that God gave us. So here too, Moshe is coming and he's telling God, listen, you have Avram, you have Yitzchak, you have Yaakov, you can't just let him completely be diminished in that difficult state of Gullus, in that difficult state of exile, there is no way that you are going to be able to get rid of them because really you had promised something so importantly to their parents and you got to let it go. This is what Rashi said. The interesting thing is, like we said before, they are mentioned backwards. And when you are mentioned backwards, Rashi clearly seems to indicate that really there would have been enough little credit and therefore Yaakov is enough for them. If you still need more, Yitzchak, which is greater than Yaakov, is going to be added to their list. And if you really need more, then you have Avram, where there is nothing, no one as great as Avram. This is the bris always. This is the covenant which is mentioned in this parsha. Clearly, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov are married to reach the place where they reached, where they arrived, is because of the, the way they serve the Shem, their commitment, the way to cleave to Hashem, especially Avram. There's always the discussion. Who is greater, Yaakov or Avram? In one end, you say Avram is great. Why is Avram greater? Because Avram was raised nowhere. He had a father, Terach, an idol worshiper. He had no environment. There was no Jewish education. There was no home to learn from. And he still went ahead and taught himself and committed himself to God and to his Torah. This is the greatest thing you can see. It's called a self-made man, right? He, saw, he, he reached and he accomplished all these great things that he had accomplished on his own. There was no assistance. And therefore, Avram in one hand represents a certain value that nobody else has. But you can look at it differently too. And you say, wait, when it comes to credit, let's consider the fact that Yaakov was always in an environment of holiness. He grew up in a good home. He grew up with a mama like Rivka, with a father like Yitzchak. When he was a child, he was already sitting in the tent of shame and aver, never left his yeshiva, never left the school. He was a real good person to the point that in certain places we refer to Yaakov as the choiciest of the parents because he was the choiciest being that he was always in a good place from the get-go. It's almost like the tzaddik who is born at tzaddik. And then you have the Baal Tshuva who is great, but he was, he had some years that he was involved in uh, no good. And there's always the debate, you know, who takes precedence? What has more value? What has more quality? And obviously, they both have a certain value that the other doesn't have. The Talmud makes a statement that, when it, to the, that even a tzaddik, the righteous person, can never reach the place of a Baal Tshuva. 
the Baal Tshuva is much higher than a tzaddik, because the Baal Tshuva is coming from a place of nowhere, and he was able to overcome his challenges and choose on his own with his strength and energy to go and turn to Hashem. That's the power of a Baal Tshuva. The tzaddik, he was born there. He was born. Sometimes when you're born, you don't get credit. It's like, you know, you can climb Mount Everest. You climb, you climb, you climb. And you have now a friend, David Schneider, is here, he's back from in Cochabamba, I'm not sure where he was. He was climbing this big mountain, some Chico or something in, uh, in Peru. And he was very excited. He posted a picture that he, he arrived. Imagine you work yourself and you train yourself and you get to the top of the mountain. And then you see a five-year-old boy is up there jumping around. And you turn to him and you feel like, what? All with my experience and all my reading that I did before in all my training, I finally made it. And you are here, a five, six, seven-year-old boy running around. How did that happen? And you really become depressed. Ooh, it's almost like nothing to be proud of. This child had, had, had reached it. But then you find out that this child never climbed the mountain. His grandfather climbed it. He was already born there. He was born on top of the mountain. So when you're born on top of the mountain, then there is no credit for it. <laughs> you, what else do you know? You were always on the top. Let's see, going from downward, climbing upward, if you make it, then we will discuss whether I have something to show off or something I should share my picture with. But as long as the child was born there, so if this is his natural place to be, then there is no greatness. And therefore, sometimes we look at the tzaddik and we say, hey, Yaakov. What else do you know, Yaakov? With a father like Yitzchak and a mother like Rivka, obviously you are Yaakov. But you know, my father was. My father, Avram says, was Terach. Terach. A garnish. And look, I worked myself up and I figured out that there is a God in the world. So obviously, in on one hand, there is greater credit to Avram over Yaakov. In the other end, you can take away from the fact that somebody is always in the atmosphere of holiness and gdusha and, and, and sanctity and in a healthy environment that, there, you know, there is something valuable to it. And this is the way the Torah teaches us. Sometimes the Torah mentions Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Avram being first and then Yitzchak and then Yaakov, which as we said in Rashi, it means that we, if we need a little credit, we use the first. If we need more, we need the second. If we need even more, then we go to the third. So if you mention Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, who is the one who apparently represents the greatest level of credit? Yaakov. But if you talk about Yaakov, Yitzhak, and Avram, so what do you say? That who serves, who brings the bigger credit? Avram. And this is the way we look at it. Sometimes it is the advantage of Avram representing his commitment. And sometimes it is the advantage of Yaakov representing the fact that he was always with it, always in the program. And both of them are needed. Both of them are needed depending on the situation. Here in our Pasha, the difference between the parasha that we spoke about earlier, the story of the golden calf, in both cases, we needed a lot of credit, a lot of help, right? That we're looking for them. Dear, we worship the calf, and here we are stuck in a very bitter, difficult, challenging exile. But what is the difference? The difference is very simple. In the story of the golden calf, we, the people, messed up. We brought it upon ourselves, the difficulty. We couldn't control ourselves and we went to worship a golden calf. So now Moshe is trying to 
approach God and try to convince Hashem that despite what the people that messed up, let's use the credit of their ancestor. In such a case, you bring about the credit of a person who had committed himself despite his situation. In other words, when we talk about what the people had wronged themselves, right, by their behavior, so you want to bring the so-called the antidote for it is by bringing the ones who improve their behavior. And that's why who is the first one and who has the greatest credit and value in improving himself? Avram. Avram came from nowhere and it took him a journey of many years. The Rambam comes out that he started on the age of three and he only reached his completion on the age of 48, which means that 45 years he was trying to figure it out all on its own. In that case, that makes very well sense to mention first who? Avram. And then say, listen, if you need more, me have Yitzchok. If you need really more, me have even Yaakov. But Avram really is the respond to a situation when people mess up their own life and bring themselves to a situation that we need to help them. So we say they did wrong. I understand. Let's give them a second chance because they have a forefather who did right. This week's parasha is a whole different story. This week's parasha, we are in a state of exile. This is the discussion of the parasha. We are not bringing the trouble on ourselves. Yes, originally we were the ones who sinned. But now the situation is that God is the one who is punishing us. It came from above. Something which is not to with us. We are... We are, deaf, we, are, we, are, we are in the end of Hashem. And he decided to put us in trouble. What is the response to such a situation? You using the credit of somebody, of a Jew, who also was not on his own, but based on his surrounding, he was able to show his commitment to God. So then they be telling God, even though it's not on our own, we can't do nothing, still rely on Yaakov, rely on that person who also not on his own achievement, but the credit that he had from the surrounding, from his family around them, was able to show his commitment to you. This concept of mentioning our forefathers we all know that the Amida prayer starts every morning and every afternoon and every evening with this blessing, Baruch Atu Hashem, Melekeinu, Meleke Aviseinu. Right away we say the God of our fathers, Meleke Yavram, Meleke Yitzchok, Meleke Yaakov. Later we speak about the, the great God, the awesome, the holy, but the first thing we mention is that we are children of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Matter of fact, the Mishnah tells us in the Talmud tracted Yuma and tracted Tomid, it says as follows. In the temple, there was a morning offering every single day, known as the public daily offering, Korban Tamit Shachal, the daily morning offering. And that daily morning offering was only offered after the sun had rise. Right? You had to wait for sunrise. And then you offer this offering. So how do you know that the sun rise? You look outside and you see the sun rise. That's how you know the sun rise. Today, we look at our clock. And we know that we read in New York Times, in Seattle Times, that sunrise is whatever, um, uh, 4, uh, you know, 3.30 a.m. So we know that this is sunrise, even though we don't go outside. In the temple, during temple times, 
it was the following very interesting phenomenon. Every morning, they had a person who was, so he was called the Memune. Memune means the one in charge. He was like the Gabai, telling everybody what to do. And he, he was throwing laps to see who is going to do that part of the service and who is going to do that part of the service. Because every part of the service was done with special order. And the order was, I'm quoting most of the sacrifice, uh, sacrifice, sacrificial um, services was done by raffle. Because everybody wanted to be a part of it. So they used to have a whole system that you raffled up who is going to do this today and who is going to do this today. And then the next day it continued. There was a whole program which is very specifically being described in a tracted of Talmud called Tracted Tamid. That's the name of the Talmudic tractate of the 60 tractates of Talmud. One is called Tamid. Tamid means ongoing, everlasting. And this tractate of Talmud is designated specifically to describe and to discuss the daily sacrifice of the temple. It's a short tractate, you should all study it. It's only 10 pages. And then it says, that what happened every morning, the way they figured out if it's the sun had rise, they didn't ask the Gabai, is it outside light already? No. The way it worked, that this person, the Memune, the one in charge, used to make a, a, a declaration. And he said the following, the sun had rise in Hebron. He was able to somehow be able to watch the reflection of the sun through the mountains of Jerusalem, seeing it all the way to Hebron. And that's what he had mentioned. So the Talmud wonders, what are you mentioning Hebron? We are in Jerusalem. Yes, Hebron is close to Jerusalem. Hebron is very holy. But why do you mention every morning the sunrise in Hebron? Maybe say it's sunrise in Tel Aviv. At sunrise in Chveizvu, uh, in Etzfat. What is Hebron? Our sages tell us in the Talmud. It was mentioned every morning in order to initiate the service of the temple by mentioning our forefathers who are buried in Hebron. Those who are in Hebron, the patriarchs and the matriarchs who are in Hebron, and we want to bring them into the program. We want to make sure to have a good day in the temple. You're going to say, I am a descendant of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. How do you do it? You say, the sun rises in Hebron. Oh, Hebron, Hebron. Hashem heals Hebron. By the way, it reminds them, it triggers the story of Hebron. And you can be confirmed that you're going to end up in a great, wonderful day of service. Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. By Hasidim, there is an old discussion. How much can you count on the credit of your ancestors? It's a big debate. Some people put a tremendous emphasis and they always talk about, oh, my Zayde, my Baba, oh, wow, would they people? And they keep on using it and reusing it on their behalf. And some people argue. Some say, like I said before, too much mentioning of the ancestors is going to also turn out to a demand to you. Are you like your ancestors? Like this, I better not talk about them. So they're not comparing me to them. So I can be fine with the little I am. But the truth is that in Hasidus it says, based on the Kabbalah, that even ancestors is not always something which can protect you. But it still can help you. Meaning, ultimately, we have our choices. We're going to do what we want. 
whether Yuzayda was this big rabbi in Tzadik or Yuzayda was this big gangster. It's always going to be your own choice. You have grandchildren of gangsters who are the most amazing, wonderful people. And you have grandchildren of Tzadikim who are the biggest criminals. But the, what ancestors can do is when one decides to go on a good path, calling upon the help and the assistance of his ancestors of the past can be a help. Because there are connections of souls, which when they hear that call, they try to so-called advocate on your behalf. And that is where it is possible and sensible to mention them. Schus Abbas, the merit of ancestors, the merit of our forefathers, like we do it with Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Matter of fact, every single morning, even before we David, we read the story of the binding of Isaac. And not because we are expected to go through a similar story every day, and that's why we are reading it. We are reading it simply in order to arouse that merit and that memory and that reflection to where we come from and who we belong to and that allowing us even further help and support to follow the right path. This is Chus Abbas. But the Chus Abbas has to be able to channel down. You can't just mention their names and feel that Ocus Pocus, I'm going to be okay. Matter of fact, most of the times it works the opposite. Even the Talmud makes a statement that kids of scholars are not so scholarly. Why? Because they rely. My father is a scholar. Probably I, I know it all. You don't realize that your father worked very hard to become a scholar. And it was his toiling and laboring which got him to this point. But at the same time, if you choose to follow his path, he's going to be there to help you. We are getting ready for a holiday called Shavuot. Shavuot is going to be in two in a, in a, in a week and a half from this past sun, in two weeks from the past Sunday. This is going to happen straight off Shabbos. We are entering the holiday of Shavuot. We all know what Shavuot is. This is the day which marks and celebrates the giving of the Torah. This is the day that we stood at Sinai and we committed ourselves to the giving of the Torah. It's something very interesting that one of the customs of Shavuot, next week at Willing on Wednesday, we'll have a whole class about Shavuot. But there's something interesting about Shavuot that we are, there's a custom in many synagogues and even homes that they bring in trees, branches of trees. In some synagogues, they actually put trees. Some of them have branches. Some people bring flowers. But the idea is to decorate the house and to decorate the shul with nice leaves coming off the trees. If you're going to Google it, I'm sure you're going to find beautiful synagogues with amazing decoration. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Chabad is not completely into this custom. So we don't do it. But I grew up in Jerusalem and a part of the Shavuot experience was to go into different shuls and to see a, who beautified the synagogue nicer than the other. Beautiful especially the Ark, the Aron Kodesh, they make all kinds of arrangements to make it look as beautiful as it is. And this is based on what the Talmud tells us, that Shavuot is the day of judgment for the fruit of the tree. We know that we have two Bishvat, the 15th of Shvat, is a new year for the trees. This is the day of judgment for the trees themselves. 
Shavuot is when the fruit is being judged, it being decided how good the fruit should be. That's what the Talmud says. So somebody asked the following question. He asked, it doesn't make sense. Two Bishvat, when the trees are being judged, what are we displaying on the table? Fruit. Shavuot, when the fruit is being judged, what are we displaying? Branches and trees. Could have been the opposite. To Bishvat, when the trees is being judged, we should display trees and branches to remember and to somehow celebrate it. And hopefully it will bring them a good judgment. Shavuot, when the fruit is being judged, then to have a display of fruit. But somehow it's kung fakir, the opposite. Shavuot, you eat fruit. And I'm sorry, to Bishvat, you eat fruit. And Shavuot is when you bring in the trees. This is called in the Talmud, the day of judgment. People have a day of judgment. And trees have a day of judgment. And fruit have a day of judgment. Everybody is being judged and decided by God in different times of the year. So why is it? Why is it Shavuot that we eat fruit when the trees are being judged? And why is it on Tu Bishvat? I'm sorry, on Shavuot we eat fruit and we bring in trees when the fruit is being judged. And the answer is based on what we said before. The answer is based on what we said before. The answer is as follows. When you want to judge the tree, how do you judge it? You look at them and you say, what kind of fruit did you bear? I want to know who you are. Let me look at your children. Let me see at your fruit, at your offspring. If they can prove themselves to be good and normal, you're okay. When you want to judge the fruit and you give them a verdict, you look on the trees, you say, let's see where they come from, like we said before in the beginning of class. And based on who they come from, you can decide what verdict to give them. And this is exactly what's happening here. When you want to deal with the trees, which is Tubishvat, you eat fruit because the fruit is going to testify how good the trees were by seeing how wonderful the fruit is. When it comes Shavuot, you want to judge the fruit. Let's bring in the trees so then we can see if they are good. So you know they came from good trees. If they are not, perhaps they're trees' fault, not their fault. So we can somehow give it another try. This is the story of this verse in this parish. God is telling us in bold ways. I can go in bold ways. In one end, this is the biggest value that we have with us. The biggest value that we have is that we come from trees, we have fruit which come off of those amazing tall trees called Avra, Mitzchok, and Yak. This is our, this is the people we come from. That gives us a chance. That gives us inspiration. That gives us validity. That gives us strength. Look where we come from. We cannot get lost. We are coming from such powerful rooted trees. All the winds of the world cannot cause us to fall far away from it. Yes, sometimes there is what they call an unusual wind and they can take a fruit very far. But this is unfortunately the very unusual winds that we should never be tested with. But in the normal circumstances, as the English saying goes, a fruit does not fall far from its tree. And if we have wonderful trees, the fruit are gonna be all right. We just to make sure that the trees are okay. And on the same time, and on the same time, knowing that we come from such wonderful trees, new, what are we waiting for? We have the strength, we have the energy, we have the blessings, we have the credits. Time to be mentioned. Time to grow up. 
getting ready for Shavuos, the holiday of the fruit being judged, which is us. Let us remember the trees we come from. As the Pasha says, even in the most difficult times, ultimately, that's the last ending verse of this big admonishment. Hashem says, whatever is going to happen in the worst calamities, Ultimately, the Zacharti is Brisi Yaakov, the Afis Brisi Yitzchok, the Afis Brisi Avro, Mesko, and Voret Esko. I able to remember, and I'm not going to get let you get lost. This is the secret of Jewish survival. But everybody writes about, everybody talks about, everybody admires. Look at them, look at them, look at them. Always making it back, always, always, always a comeback. What is it? great minds, any magic. It is simple. We are coming from such powerful trees that we cannot rot. We cannot move. We cannot be eradicated. Our trees would never let us happen. The trees are always protecting us. This is the protective trees of Avro, Mitzvah, and Yaakov, which keeps us going it will keep us going. And as long that we have the ability to hold strong with them. I want to finish up with a story. I mentioned a little earlier the word, but the story is a real story. There was a couple, a father and mother, which the Nebuch had a son who completely went astray from the way of Judaism. They both walked into the Rebbe and they were kind of blaming themselves for the situation. And they told the Rebbe, it's our fault. We must be not good people. As the saying goes, a fruit does not fall far from his tree. If this is the fruit, something wrong with us. We are, we are to be blamed. And the Rebbe told him exactly those words I said earlier. This is actually where I took it from. The Rebbe said, a fruit does not fall far from the tree in a usual wind. But when there is an unusual wind, when there's a tornado, when there's a storm, fruit can go very far from the tree. And it's not the tree's fault. It's the wind's fault. The Rebbe looking at them, we live in a world which unfortunately the winds blowing out there is not the usual winds. This is what happened last night in Texas, yesterday. This is not a little beyond. This is completely and entirely unbearable, unacceptable, incomprehensible. It doesn't make any sense on no level. And I hear from this person, that person, Somebody is talking about the gun control. Somebody else talks about mental control. Everybody is trying to figure out what somebody else needs to do in order to save the situation. Everybody needs to do something. The Rambam says, if you see a tragedy and you ignore it and you say, eh, okay, this is the Hispanic community in Texas. What do I have with them? Baruch Hashem, I'm in Bellevue. Quiet, says the Rambam, you know what you are considered? A cruel person. That's what the Rambam says. Achzari calls them in Hebrew. You are cruel. If you heard that news, it is a lesson to you. I'm not sure, probably we would never know what happened to this 18-year-old boy who went on such a, a terrible journey, taking little kids second, you know, uh, second graders, I believe. It's, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. It, you can't even let you, it doesn't even come into your mind. But the one thing, we can definitely look at that, what happened here, and what happened in Buffalo, again, a few weeks ago, an 18 year old, and what you see Bechlau, the world around us, and we see a lot more that we used to see. What I want to say is, it's a very unusual wind blowing out there. Not everybody is to be, anybody should be blamed, not the parents, not the teachers. 
the blame is what goes on outside is a very crazy world. The world is, the winds are unusual. They see and hear things that me never heard. I'm not talking people that are older than me never heard. The things they watch, the things they, they, they hear, the which they follow. Anyway, the point is, one thing we can definitely tell the Bayin Shleila, master of the world, time for a change. You know, it's not always in our hands. Even in this parsha, things are difficult, difficult. He says, God says, okay, I see it's enough. I will remember Abram. I will remember Yitzchak. I will remember Yaakov. This is, this is, this is it. This is it. Hashem is to remember them and their credit in all the credits which was collected collectively to add all the generations of the good things that people did. And definitely our ancestors did good things to bring it all together, pile it all up, and make the final decision. It's time to make the world better. It's time to bring Mashiach, bring an end of this Golos, and get ready to celebrate Shavuos with a new commitment to Torah and to his mitzvahs, and follow the way Hashem is, a way of peace and security, and obviously never know from any pain or from any tzores, from now and forever. Amen. 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 Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I want to welcome back David Schneider, who just came back from Peru. He looks very, um, very, very um, tired. Did I say it? No, I... Go sleep. No, I got to leave tomorrow. Were you going in? Oh, yes, you're going to Oregon. That's right. Okay. Anybody else want to share something? You can undo your, your what's it called? You can unmute yourself. If you want to share some words of wisdom or inspiration, we are ready to hear you. I'm going to be quiet. No. No one wants to say anything. I'm going to find myself a mattress. Ah. I lay here. What do you say? I'm going to find myself a mattress. It is very late here. It is now uh, going on uh, 2,300 hours. Oh, in Chicago? Yeah, a little south of Chicago. Yeah, I think I'm giving you permission. Go take a nap. Thank you. Good night, Rabbi. All the best. Lila. Fascinating. Anybody else wants to say good night, Rabbi? Arnold, say something of some words of wisdom in honor of the situation. No, Lila Tov. <laughs> That's my word. That's tired. <laughs> He's having a long day. <laughs> Why? What happened? Who are you? Oh. Okay, I'm not gonna ask. Quite a lot going on today. Yeah. I'm not gonna ask. I'm not gonna ask. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Rabbi, we can't be this Shabbos in synagogue because I've been busy getting things ready. I've got two grandchildren and a dog to take care of from tomorrow night, tomorrow afternoon, <coughs> until Monday. My daughter and son-in-law are going out of town for the first time. I have two grandchildren and a dog together. And I can't deal with all of the anger. I'm very Sunday. scared that after this Monday, it's going to take another three weeks to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you go like this: the kids comes first, not the dog. You know that, right? All right. <laughs> the dog and is then, easy in some ways compared to the the youngest one. Anyway, he's an old dog already. You can always call nine one one for emergencies. <laughs> Make sure that you have a lot of candy at home and it's going to be quiet. No, 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 not filling them up to get them hyper with sugar. <laughs> that I don't want them. The little ones hyper enough can get. I don't need more hype in this room. Okay. It's okay. Listen, you raised two kids not too many years ago. I'm sure you remember <laughs> how to do it. Right. And if you're going to need uh, advice, you can always call your father for advice. <laughs> And for a second, I'm a strict to them, my father. I think I'm a strict stuff. You call uh, my daughter lives not far from you. If it gets really difficult, <laughs> Just I'm sure she's going to be happy uh, to uh, to bring you some more kids. Okay, it's going to be an experience. 
We'll be all right. No worries. Right. We'll be all right. <laughs> we will she'll survive. Yeah. I'll survive. Yeah. She will be okay. And How's this, Ruch? Is she better? I've been meaning to call. I've just been so busy. This she's week. all right. Baruch How's Hashem. the strep throat? She, uh, she's better. Baruch Hashem. Yeah. She was last week. She didn't come to Shul Shabbos either last Shabbos. Right. I know, I know. Right. right. I meant to call. I've just been so busy getting ready before the children and dog come. Uh, the main thing, don't forget to come on Shavuos. Whatever happens, Shabbos. No, no. The children, everything's a back to the Sunday, oh. A big yeah. Ten Commandments. We're going to recommit ourselves to the Torah. We're going to have a nice Kiddush, God willing. We're going to celebrate Shavuos properly. Okay, my friends, like Arnold said, Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Laila Tov, Rabbi. Bye, Bernard. Thank you. Bye. 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 Everybody be well. Shlomo, Thank good you. to yeah. welcome you to our class. Shlomo Davidov, good to see you. Of course, of course. I will. Yeah. A good beginning. A good beginning. All right. Thank you.